Chapter One of the Mystery of the Sycamore. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sharon Kilmer, San Antonio, Texas. The Mystery of the Sycamore by Carolyn Wells. The Letter That Said Come. As the character of a woman may be accurately deduced from her handkerchief, so a man's mental status is evident from the way he opens his mail. Curtis Keefe, engaged in this daily performance, slit the envelopes neatly and laid the letters down in three piles. These divisions represented matters known to be of no great interest, matters known to be important, and third, letters with contents as yet unknown and therefore of problematical value the first two piles were as usual dispatched quickly and the real attention of the secretary centered with pleasant anticipation on the third lot gee whiz genevieve as no further pearls of wisdom fell from the lips of the engrossed reader of letters the stenographer gave him a round-eyed glance and then continued her work curtis keefe was of course called curt by his intimates and while it may be the obvious nickname was brought about by his short and concise manner of speech it is more probable that the abbreviation was largely responsible for his habit of curtness anyway keefe had long cultivated a crisp abrupt style of conversation that is until he fell in with samuel appleby that worthy ex-governor while in the act of engaging keefe to be his confidential secretary observed they call you curt do they well see to it that it is short for courtesy this was only one of several equally sound bits of advice from the same source and as keefe had an eye single to the glory of self-advancement he kept all these things and pondered them in his heart the result was that ten years of association with lawyer appleby had greatly improved the young man's manner and though still brief of speech his curtness had lost its unpleasantly sharp edge and his courtesy had developed into a dignified urbanity so that though still curt keefe it was in name only what's the pretty letter all about curty asked the observant stenographer who had noticed his third reading of the short missive you'll probably answer it soon and then you'll know was the reply as keefe restored the sheet to its envelope and took up the next letter Genevieve Lane produced her vanity case and became absorbed in its possibilities. "'I wish I didn't have to work,' she sighed. "'I wish I was an opera singer. "'Cromwell, I charge thee. "'Fling away ambition,' murmured Keefe, his eyes still scanning letters. "'By that sin fell the angels, and it's true you are angelic, Viva. "'So down you'll go if you fall for ambition.' how you talk ambition is a good thing only when tempered by common sense and perspicacity neither of which you possess to a marked degree pooh you're ambitious yourself curt with the before mentioned qualifications look here viva here's a line for you to remember i ran across it in a book if you do only what is absolutely correct and say only what is absolutely correct you can do anything you like how's that i don't see any sense in it at all no i told you you liked common sense most women do huh and genevieve tossed her pretty head patted her curly earmuffs and proceeded with her work samuel appleby's beautiful home graced the town of stockfield in the western end of the commonwealth of massachusetts former governor appleby was still a political power and a man of unquestioned force and importance it was fifteen years or more since he had held office and now a great desire possessed him that his son should follow in his ways and that his beloved state should know another governor of the appleby name and young sam was worthy of the people's choice 
himself a man of forty motherless from childhood and brought up sensibly and well by his father he listened gravely to the paternal plans for the campaign but there were other candidates and not without some strong and definite influences could the end be attained wherefore mr appleby was quite as much interested as his secretary in the letter which was in the morning's mail any word from sycamore height he asked as he came into the big cheerful office and nodded a kindly good morning to his two assistants yes and a good word returned keefe smiling it says come the secretary's attitude toward his employer though deferential and respectful was marked by a touch of good fellowship a not unnatural outgrowth of a long term of confidential relations between them keefe had made himself invaluable to samuel appleby and both men knew it so as one had no desire to presume on the fact and the other no wish to ignore it serenity reigned in the well-ordered and well-appointed offices of the ex-governor even the light-haired light-hearted and light-headed genevieve couldn't disturb the even tenure of the routine if she could have she would have been fired though not a handsome man not even to be called distinguished-looking samuel appleby gave an impression of power his strong lean face betokened obdurate determination and implacable will its deep graven lines were the result of meeting many obstacles and surmounting most of them and at sixty-two the hale and hearty frame and the alert efficient manner made the man seem years younger you know the conditions on which wheeler lives in that house appleby asked as he looked over the top of the letter at keefe no sir well it's this way but no i'll not give you the story now we're going down there to-day the whole tribe asked keefe briefly yes all three of us be ready miss lane please at three thirty yes sir said genevieve reaching for her vanity box and now keefe as to young sam appleby went on running his fingers through his thick iron-gray mane if he can put it over or if i can put it over for him it will be only with the help of dan wheeler is wheeler willing to help probably not he must be made willing i can do it i think unless he turns stubborn i know wheeler if he turns stubborn well balaam's historic quadruped had nothing on him does mr wheeler know sam no and it wouldn't matter either way if he did it's the platform wheeler stands on if i can keep him in ignorance of that one plank you can't i know it confound it he opposed my election on that one point he'll oppose sam's for the same reason i know where do i come in in a general way i want your help wheeler's wife and daughter are attractive and you might manage to interest them and maybe sway their sympathies towards sam but they'll stand by mr wheeler probably yes however use your head and do all you can with it and where do i come in asked genevieve who had been an interested listener you don't come in at all miss you mostly stay out you're to keep in the background i have to take you for we're only staying one night at sycamore ridge and then going on to boston and i'll need you there yes sir and the blue eyes turned from him and looked absorbedly into a tiny mirror as genevieve contemplated her pleasant pink and whiteness her vanity and its accompanying box were matters of indifference to mr appleby and to keefe for the girl's efficiency and skill outweighed them and her diligence and loyalty scored one hundred per cent appleby's fetish was efficiency he had found it and recognized it in his secretary and stenographer and he was willing to recompense it duly even generously wherefore the law business of samuel appleby though carried on for the benefit of a small number of clients was of vast importance and productive of lucrative returns 
at present the importance was overshadowed by the immediate interest of a campaign which if successful would land the second appleby in the gubernatorial chair this plan as yet not a boom was taking shape with neatness and dispatch that characterized the appleby work young sam was content to have the matter principally in his father's hands and things had reached a pitch where to the senior mind the cooperation of daniel wheeler was imperatively necessary and therefore to wheeler's house they must betake themselves what do you know about the wheeler business kid keefe inquired after mr appleby had left them genevieve leaned back in her chair her dimpled chin moving up and down with a pretty rhythm as she enjoyed her chewing gum and gazed at the ceiling beams appleby's offices were in his own house and the one given over to these two was an attractive room fine with mahogany and plate glass but also provided with all the paraphernalia of the most up-to-date of office furniture there were good pictures and draperies and a wood fire added to the cheer and mitigated the chill of the early fall weather sidling from her seat miss lane moved over to a chair near the fire i'll take those letters when you're ready she said why i don't know a single thing about any wheeler do you not definitely he's a man who had an awful fight with mr appleby long ago i've heard allusions to him now and then but i know no details i either but it seems we're to go there only for a night and then on to boston won't i be glad to go we'll only be there a few days i'm more interested in this wheeler performance i don't understand it who's wheeler anyhow don't know if sammy turns up this morning he may enlighten us sammy did turn up and not long after the conversation young appleby strolled into the office though still looked upon as a boy by his father the man of huge proportions and of an important slightly overbearing attitude somewhat like his parent in appearance young sam as he was always called had more grace and ease if less effect of power he smiled genially and impartially he seemed cordial and friendly to all the world and he was a general favorite yet so far he had achieved no great thing had no claim to any especial record in public or private life at forty unmarried and unattached his was a case of an able mentality and a firm reliable character with no opportunity offered to prove its worth a little more initiative and he would have made opportunities for himself but a nature that took the line of least resistance a philosophy that believed in a calm acceptance of things as they came left sam appleby jr pretty much where he was when he began if no man could say aught against him equally surely no man could say anything very definite for him yet many agreed that he was a man whose powers would develop with acquired responsibilities and already he had a following hello little one he greeted genevieve carelessly as he sat down near keefe i say old chap you're going down to the wheelers today i hear yes this afternoon and the secretary looked up inquiringly well i'll tell you what you know the governor's going there to get wheeler's aid in my election boom and i can tell you a way to help things along if you agree see not yet but go ahead well it's this way dan wheeler's daughter is devoted to her father not only filial respect and all that but she just fairly idolizes the old man now he recipes of course and what she says goes so i'm asking you squarely won't you put in a good word to maida that's the girl and if you do it with your inimitable dexterity and grace she'll fall for it you mean for me to praise you up to miss wheeler and ask her father to give you the benefit of his influence how clearly you do put things that's exactly what i mean it's no harm you know merely the most innocent sort of electioneering rather laughed keefe 
if all electioneering were as innocent as that the word would carry no unpleasant meaning then you'll do it of course i will if i get opportunity oh you'll have that it's a big rambling country house a delightful one too and there's tea in the hall and tennis on the lawn and moonlight on the verandas hold up sam keefe warned him is the girl pretty haven't seen her for years but probably yes but that's nothing to you you're working for me you see appleby's glance was direct and keefe understood of course i was only joking i'll carry out your commission if as i said i get the chance tell me something of mr wheeler oh he's a good old chap pathetic really you see he bumped up against dad once and got the worst of it how sam appleby hesitated a moment and then said i see you don't know the story but it's no secret and you may as well be told you listen too miss lane but there's no call to tattle i'll go home if you say so genevieve piped up a little crispy no sit still why it was while dad was governor about fifteen years ago i suppose and daniel wheeler forged a paper that is he said he didn't but twelve other good and true peers of his said he did anyway he was convicted and sentenced but father was a good friend of his and being governor he pardoned wheeler but the pardon was on condition oh i say hasn't dad ever told you keefe never then maybe i'd better leave it for him to tell if he wants you to know he'll tell you and if not i mustn't oh goodness cried genevieve what a way to go get us all excited over a thrilling tale and then chop it off short go on with it said keefe but appleby said no i won't tell you the condition of the pardon but the two men haven't been friends since and won't be unless the condition is removed of course dad can't do it but the present governor can make the pardon complete and would do so in a minute if dad asked him to so though he hasn't said so the assumption is that father expects to trade a full pardon of friend wheeler for his help in my campaign and a good plan keefe nodded his satisfaction but sam went on the trouble is that the very same points and principles that made wheeler oppose my father's election will make him oppose mine the party is the same the platform is the same and i can't hope that the man wheeler is not the same stubborn adamant unbreakable old hickory knot he was the other time and so you want me to soften him up by persuading his daughter to line up on our side just that keefe and you can do it i am sure i'll try of course but i doubt if even a favorite daughter could influence the man you describe let me help broke in the irrepressible genevieve i can do lots with a girl i can do more than kurt could i'll chum up with her and now miss lane you keep out of this i don't believe in mixing women and politics but miss wheeler's a woman and i don't want her troubled with politics keefe here can persuade her to coax her father just through her affections i don't want her enlightened as to any of the political details and i can't think your influence would work half as well as that of a man moreover keefe has discernment and if it isn't a good plan after all he'll know enough to discard it while you'd blunder ahead blindly and queer the whole game oh well and bridling with offended pride genevieve sought refuge in her little mirror now don't get huffy and sam smiled at her you'll probably find that miss wheeler's complexion is finer than yours anyway and then you'll hate her and won't want to speak to her at all miss lane flashed an indignant glance and then proceeded to go on with her work hasn't wheeler tried for a pardon all this time keefe asked indeed he has sam returned many times but you see though successive governors were willing to grant it father always managed to prevent it dad can pull lots of wires as you know and since he doesn't want wheeler fully pardoned why 
he doesn't get fully pardoned and he lives under the stigma lots of people don't know about the thing at all he lives well he lives in connecticut and oh of course there is a certain stigma and your father would bring about his full pardon if he promises let up keefe i've said i can't tell you that part you'll get your instructions in good time and look here i don't mean for you to make love to the girl in fact i'm told she has a suitor but you're just to give her a little song and dance about my suitability for the election and then adroitly persuade her to use her powers of persuasion with her stubborn father for he will be stubborn i know it and there's the mother of the girl tackle mrs wheeler make her see that my father was justified in the course he took and besides he was more or less accountable to others and use as an argument that years have dulled the old feud and that bygones ought to be bygones and all that try to make her see that a full pardon now will be as much and in a way more to wheeler's credit than if it had been given him at first i can't see that and keith looked quizzical neither can i sam confessed frankly but you can make a woman swallow anything depends on what sort of woman mrs wheeler is keith mused i know it i haven't seen her for years and as i remember she's pretty keen but i'm banking on you to put over some of your clever work not three men in boston have your ingenuity keith when it comes to sizing up a situation and knowing just how to handle it now don't tell father all i've said for he doesn't especially hold with such small measures he's all for the one big slam game and he may be right but i'm right too and you just go ahead all right keefe agreed i see what you mean and i'll do all i can that doesn't in any way interfere with your father's directions to me there's a possibility of turning the trick through the women folks and if i can do it you may count on me good and as for you miss lane you keep in the background and make as little mischief as you can i'm not a mischief maker said the girl pouting playfully for she was not at all afraid of sam appleby your blue eyes and pink cheeks make mischief wherever you go he returned but don't try them on old dan wheeler he's a morose old chap i should think he would be defended genevieve living all these years under a ban which may after all be undeserved i've heard that he was entirely innocent of the forgery have you indeed appleby's tone was unpleasantly sarcastic other people have also heard that from the wheeler family those better informed believe the man guilty and believe too that my father was too lenient when he granted even a conditional pardon but just think if he was innocent how awful his life has been all these years you bet he'll accept the full pardon and give us all his effort and influence and any possible help in return hear the child orate exclaimed sam gazing at the enthusiastic little face as genevieve voiced her views i think he'll be ready to make the bargain too declared keefe your father has a strong argument i fancy wheeler's jump at the chance maybe maybe so but you don't know how opposed he is to our principles and he's a man of immovable convictions in fact he and dad are two mighty strong forces one or the other must win out but i've no idea which it will be how exciting genevieve's eyes danced i'm so glad i'm to go it's a pretty place you say wonderful a great sweep of rolling country a big long rambling sort of house and a splendid hospitality you'll enjoy the experience but remember i told you to be good i will remember and genevieve pretended to look cherubic End of chapter 1
by Carolyn Wells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. North Door and South Door For Samuel Appleby to pay a visit to Daniel Wheeler was of itself an astounding occurrence. The two men had not seen each other since the day fifteen years ago when Governor Appleby had pardoned the convicted Wheeler with a condition which, though harsh, had been strictly adhered to. They had never been friends at heart, for they were diametrically opposed in their political views and were not of similar tastes or pursuits, but they had been thrown much together, and when the time came for Wheeler to be tried for forgery, Appleby lent no assistance to the case. However, through certain influences brought to bear, in connection with the fact that Mrs. Wheeler was related to the Applebys, the governor pardoned the condemned man, with a conditional pardon. Separated ever since, a few letters had passed between the two men, but they resulted in no change of conditions. As the big car ran southward through the Berkshire Hills, Appleby's thoughts were all on the coming meeting and the scenery of autumn foliage that provoked wild exclamations of delight from Genevieve and ascending enthusiasm from Keefe left the other unmoved. An appreciative nod and grunt were all he vouchsafed to the girl's gushing praises, and when at last they neared their destination, he called her attention to a tall old sycamore tree standing alone on a ridge not far away. "'That's the tree that gives the Wheeler place its name,' he informed. "'Sycamore Ridge is one of the most beautiful places in Connecticut.' "'Oh, are we in Connecticut?' asked Miss Lane. "'I didn't know we had crossed the border. "'What a great old tree! "'Surely one of the historic trees of New England, isn't it?' "'Historic to the Wheelers!' was the grim reply, and then Mr. Appleby again relapsed into silence and spoke no further word until they reached the Wheeler home. A finely curved sweep of driveway brought them to the house, and the car stopped at the south entrance. The door did not swing open in welcome, and Mr. Appleby ordered his chauffeur to ring the bell. This brought a servant in response, and the visiting trio entered the house. It was long and low, with many rooms on either side of the wide hall that went straight through from south to north. The first room to the right was a large living room, and into this the guests were shown and were met by a grave-looking man, who neither smiled nor offered a hand as his calm gaze rested on Samuel Appleby. Indeed, the two men stared at one another in undisguised curiosity. Each seemed to search the other's face for information as to his attitude and intent. "'Well, Dan,' Appleby said, after the silent scrutiny, "'you've changed some. But you're the same good-looking chap you always were.' Wheeler gave a start and pulled himself together. "'Thank you. I suppose I should return the compliment.' "'But you can't conscientiously do it, eh?' Appleby laughed. Never mind. Personal vanity is not my besetting sin. This is my secretary, Mr. Keefe, and my assistant, Miss Lane. Ah, yes, yes. How are you? How do you do? My wife and daughter will look after the young lady. Maida? As if awaiting the call, a girl came quickly in from the hall, followed by an older woman. Introductions followed and if there was an air of constraint on the part of the host, the ladies of the family showed none. Sunny-faced Maida Wheeler, with her laughing brown eyes and gold-brown hair, greeted the visitors with charming cordiality, and her mother was equally kind and courteous. Genevieve Lane's wise and appraising eyes missed no point of appearance or behavior. "'Perfect darlings, both of them!' she commented to herself whatever ails the old guy it hasn't bitten them or else wait a minute genevieve was very observant perhaps they're putting on a little is their welcome a bit extra to help things along 
yet only a most meticulous critic could discern anything more than true hospitality in the attitude of mrs wheeler or maida the latter took genevieve to the room prepared for her and chatted away in girlish fashion the place is so wonderful genevieve exclaimed carefully avoiding personal talk don't you just adore it oh yes i've loved sycamore ridge for nearly fifteen years have you lived here so long genevieve was alert for information it was fifteen years ago that the pardon had been granted but as maida merely assented and then changed the subject miss lane was far too canny to ask further questions with a promptness not entirely due to chance the stenographer came downstairs dressed for dinner some several minutes before the appointed hour assuming her right as a guest she wandered about the rooms the south door by which they had entered was evidently the main entrance but the opposite or north door gave on to an even more beautiful view and she stepped out on the wide veranda and gazed admiringly about the low ridge nearby formed the western horizon and the giant sycamore its straight branches outlined against the fading sunset was impressive and a little weird she strolled on and turned the corner the better to see the ridge the veranda ran all round the house and as she went on along the western side she suddenly became aware of a silent figure leaning against a pillar at the southwest corner it is so quiet it frightens me she said to daniel wheeler as she neared him do you feel that way too he asked looking at her a little absently it is the lull before the storm oh that sunset doesn't mean rain genevieve exclaimed smiling unless your connecticut blue laws interpret weather signs differently from our massachusetts prophets we are in connecticut aren't we yes and wheeler sighed unaccountably yes miss lane we are that sycamore is the finest tree in the state i can well believe it i never saw such a grandfather of a tree it's all full of little balls yes button balls they are called but note its wonderful symmetry its majestic appearance and strength it looks as if it would stand there forever do you think so and the unmistakable note of disappointment in the man's tone caused genevieve to look up in astonishment well perhaps it will he added quickly oh no of course it won't really no tree stands forever but it will be here long after you and i are gone are you an authority on trees wheeler spoke without a smile hardly that but i was brought up in the country and i know something of them your daughter loves the country too oh yes we all do the tone was courteous but the whole air of the man was so melancholy his cheerfulness so palpably assumed that genevieve felt sorry for him as well as inordinately curious to know what was the matter but her sympathy was the stronger impulse and with a desire to entertain him she said come for a few steps in the garden mr wheeler won't you come and show me that quaint little summer house near the front door it is the front door isn't it it's hard to tell yes the north door is the front door wheeler said slowly as if repeating a lesson the summer house you mention is near the front door but we won't visit that now come this other way and i'll show you a japanese tea house much more attractive but genevieve lane was sometimes under the spell of the imp of the perverse no no she begged smilingly let the japanese contraption wait please go to the little summer house now see how it fairly twinkles in the last gleams of the setting sun what is the flower that rambles all over it oh do let's go there now come please with no reason for her foolish insistence save a whim genevieve was amazed to see the look of fury that came over her host's face 
"'Appleby put you up to that,' he cried, in a voice of intense anger. "'He told you to ask me to go to that place.' "'Why, Mr. Wheeler,' cried the girl, almost frightened, "'Mr. Appleby did nothing of the sort. Why should he? I'm not asking anything wrong, am I? Why is it so dreadful to want to see an arbor instead of a tea-house? You must be crazy.' When Miss Lane was excited, she was quite apt to lose her head, and speak in thoughtless fashion. But Mr. Wheeler didn't seem to notice her informality of speech. He only stared at her as if he couldn't quite make her out, and then he suddenly seemed to lose interest in her or her wishes, and with a deep sigh he turned away, and fell into the same brooding posture as when she had first approached him. "'Come to dinner, people,' called Maida's pretty voice, as, with outstretched hands, she came toward them. "'Why, Dads, what are you looking miserable about? "'What have you done to him, Miss Lane?' "'Maida, child, don't speak like that. "'Miss Lane has been most kindly talking to me of—of of the beauties of Sycamore Ridge.' "'All right, then, and forgive me, Miss Lane, but you see— the sun rises and sets for me in one daniel wheeler esq and any shadow on his face makes me apprehensive of its cause only for an instant did genevieve lane's sense of justice rise in revolt then her common sense showed her the better way and she smiled pleasantly and returned i don't blame you miss wheeler if i had a father i should feel just the same way i know but don't do any gory lock shaking my way. I assure you I didn't really scold him. I only kicked because he wouldn't humor my whim for visiting the summer house with the blossoms trailing over it. Was that naughty of me? But though Genevieve listened for the answer, none came. Come on in to dinner, Daddy dear, Maida repeated. Come, Miss Lane, they're waiting for us. Dinner was a delightful occasion. Dan Wheeler at the head of his own table was a charming host, and his melancholy entirely disappeared as the talk ran along on subjects grave or gay, but of no personal import. Appleby, too, was entertaining, and the two men with Mrs. Wheeler carried on most of the conversation, the younger members of the party being what seemed common consent left out of it. Genevieve looked about the dining-room with a pleased interest. She dearly loved beautiful appointments, and was really imagining herself mistress of such a house, and visioning herself at the head of such a table. The long room stretched from north to south, parallel with the hall, though not adjoining. The table was not in the center, but toward the southern end, and Mr. Wheeler, at the end near the windows, had Keefe and Miss Lane on either side of him. Appleby, as guest of honor, sat at Mrs. Wheeler's right, and the whole effect was that of a formal dinner party, rather than a group of which two were merely office employees. "'It is one of the few remaining warm evenings,' said Mrs. Wheeler, as she rose from the table. "'We will have our coffee on the veranda. Soon it will be too cool for that.' "'Which veranda?' asked Genevieve of Maida, as they went through the hall. The north one, I suppose. Your hopes must be dashed, laughed the other, for it will be the south one. Come along. The two girls, followed by Keefe, took possession of a group of chairs near Mrs. Wheeler, while the two older men sat apart, and soon became engrossed in their own discussions. Nor was it long before Samuel Appleby and his host withdrew to a room which opened on to that same south veranda, and which was, in fact, Mr. Wheeler's den. "'Well, Sam,' Keefe heard the others say as he drew down the blind, "'we may as well have it out now. What are you here for?' Outwardly placid but almost consumed with curiosity, Kurt Keefe changed his seat for one nearer the window of the den. He hoped to hear the discussion going on inside, but was doomed to disappointment, for though the murmuring of the voices was audible, the words were not distinct, 
and keefe gathered only enough information to be sure that there was a heated argument in progress and that neither party to it was inclined to give in a single point of course he decided the subject was the coming election campaign but the details of desired bargaining he could not gather moreover often just as he almost heard sentences of interest the chatter of the girls or some remark of mrs wheeler's would drown the voices of the men in the room one time indeed he heard clearly when the sycamore on the ridge goes into massachusetts but this was sheer nonsense and he concluded he must have misunderstood later they foregathered in the living room and there was music and general conversation genevieve lane proved herself decidedly entertaining and though samuel appleby looked a little amusedly at his stenographer he smiled kindly at her as he noticed that she in no way overstepped the bounds of correct demeanor genevieve was thinking of what keefe had said to her if you only do what is absolutely correct and say what is only absolutely correct you can do whatever you like she had called it nonsense at the time but she was beginning to see the truth of it she was careful that her every word and act should be correct and she was most decidedly doing as she liked she made good with mrs wheeler and maida with no trouble at all but she felt vaguely that mr wheeler didn't like her this she set about to remedy going to his side as he chanced to sit for a moment alone she smiled ingratiatingly and said i wonder if you can imagine sir what it means to me to see the inside of a house like this bless my soul what do you mean asked wheeler puzzled at the girl's manner it's like a glimpse of fairyland she went on you see i'm terribly ambitious oh fearfully so and all my ambitions lead to just this sort of a home do you suppose i'll ever achieve it mr wheeler now the girl had truly wonderful magnetic charm and even staid old dan wheeler was not insensible to the note of longing in her voice the simple honest admission of her hopes of course you will little one he returned kindly i've heard that whatever one wants one gets provided the wish is strong enough he spoke directly to her but his gaze wandered as if his thoughts were far away do you really believe that genevieve's big blue eyes begged an affirmation i didn't say i believed it i said i have heard it he smiled sadly not quite the same so far as i'm concerned but quite as assuring to you of course my belief wouldn't endorse the possibility it would for me declared genevieve i've lots of confidence in other people's opinions anybody's anybody whom i respect and believe in appleby for instance oh yes indeed i'd trust mr appleby's opinions on any subject let's go over there and tell him so samuel appleby was sitting at the other end the north end of the long room no said wheeler i'm too comfortable here to move ask him to come here genevieve looked at him a little astonished it was out of order she thought for a host to speak thus she pressed the point saying there was a picture at the other end of the room she wished to examine run along then said wheeler coolly here maida show miss lane that etching and tell her the interesting details about it the girls went away and soon after keefe drifted round to wheeler's side you know young sam appleby he asked casually no wheeler said shortly but not sharply i dare say he's a most estimable chap he's all of that he's a true chip of the old block both good gubernatorial timber as i'm sure you agree what makes you so sure mr keefe kurt keefe looked straight at him 
Well, he laughed, I'm quite ready to admit that the wish was father to the thought. Why do you call that an omission? Oh, Keefe readily returned, it is usually looked upon as a confession that one has no reason for a thought other than a wish. And why is it your wish? Because it is the wish of my employer, said Keefe seriously. I know of no reason, Mr. Wheeler, why I shouldn't say that I hope and trust you will use your influence to further the cause of young Appleby. What makes you think I can do so? While I am not entirely in Mr. Appleby's confidence, he has told me that the campaign would be greatly aided by your willingness to help, and so I can't help hoping you will exercise it. Appleby has told you so much, has he? No more? No more, I think, regarding yourself, sir. I know naturally the details of the campaign so far as it is yet mapped out. And you know why I do not want to lend my aid? I know you are not in accordance with the principles of the Appleby's politics. That I am not, nor shall I ever be, nor shall I ever pretend to be. Pretend? Of course not. But could you not be persuaded? By what means? I don't know, Mr. Wheeler, and Keefe looked at him frankly. I truly don't know by what means. But I do know that Mr. Appleby is here to present to you an argument by which he hopes to persuade you to help young Sam along. And I earnestly desire to add any word of mine that may help influence your decision. That is why I want to tell you of the good traits of Sam Appleby, Jr. It may be I can give you a clearer light on his character than his father could do. That is, I might present it as the opinion of a friend, and not exaggerate his virtues as a father might do. I see. Well, Mr. Keefe, I appreciate your attitude. But let me tell you this. Whatever I do or don't do regarding this coming campaign of young Appleby will be entirely irrespective of the character or personality of that young man. It will all depend on the senior Appleby's arrangements with me and my ability to change his views on some of the more important planks in his platform. If he directed you to speak to me as you have done, you may return that to him as my answer. You doubtless said the same to him, sir? Of course I did. I make no secret of my position in this matter. Samuel Appleby has a hold over me, I admit that. But it is not strong enough to make me forget my ideas of right and wrong to the public. No influence of a personal nature should weigh against any man's duty to the state and I will never agree to pretend to any dissimulation in order to bring about a happier life for myself. But need you subscribe to the objectionable points to use your influence for young Sam? Tactically, of course. And I do not choose even to appear to agree to principles abhorrent to my sense of justice and honesty, thereby secretly gaining something for myself meaning your full pardon wheeler turned a look of surprise on the speaker i thought you said you hadn't appleby's full confidence he said nor have i i do know as do many men that you were pardoned with a condition but the condition i do not know it can't be very galling and keefe looked about on the pleasant surroundings you think not that's because you don't know the terms. And yet, galling though they are, hateful though it makes my life and the lives of my wife and daughter, we would all rather bear it than to deviate one iota from the path of strict right. I must admire you for that as much as any honorable man. But are there not degrees or shadings of right and wrong? Mr. Keefe, as an old man, I take the privilege of advising you for your own good. All through your life, I beg you remember this. 
anyone who admits degrees or shadings of right or wrong is already wrong don't be offended you didn't claim those things you merely asked the question but remember what i said about it end of chapter two chapter three of the mystery of the sycamore by carolyn wells this LibriVox recording is in the public domain one last argument adjoining the bedroom of samuel appleby at sycamore ridge was a small sitting-room also at his disposal here later that same evening he sat in confab with his two assistants we leave tomorrow afternoon he said to keefe and miss lane but before that we've much to do so far we've accomplished nothing i am a little discouraged but not disheartened i still have a trump card to play but i don't want to use it unless absolutely necessary if you are inclined to take us further into your confidence mr appleby keefe began and the older man interrupted that's just what i propose to do the time has come for it perhaps if you both know the situation you may work more intelligently sure we could exclaimed genevieve she was leaning forward in her chair clasping her knees her pretty evening frock disclosing her babyishly soft neck and arms but without a trace of self-consciousness she thought only of the subject they were discussing there's something queer she went on i can't see through it why does mr wheeler act so polite most of the time and then do some outrageous thing like like what like refusing to cross the room or why he declined point-blank to go with me to the north arbor yet was perfectly willing to take me to the japanese tea-house that's just the point of the whole thing said appleby seriously here's the explanation in a nutshell years ago daniel wheeler was pardoned for a crime he had committed he did commit it then interrupted keefe he was tried and convicted he was sentenced and i being governor at the time pardoned him on one condition that he never again set foot inside the boundaries of the state of massachusetts we oui, exclaimed genevieve never to go to boston nor anywhere else in the state but this is the complication mrs wheeler who is by the way a distant connection of my own family inherited a large fortune on condition that she live in massachusetts so you see the situation was peculiar to keep her inheritance mrs wheeler must live in massachusetts yet mr wheeler could not enter the state without forfeiting his pardon what a mess cried genevieve but keith said you planned that purposely mr appleby of course was the straightforward reply then i don't see how you can expect mr wheeler's help in the campaign by offering him a pardon of course but go on with the story demanded genevieve what did they do about the massachusetts business as you see returned appleby this house is built on the state line between massachusetts and connecticut it is carefully planned and built and all the rooms or parts of the rooms that mr wheeler uses or enters are on the connecticut side yet the house is more than half in massachusetts which secures the estate to mrs wheeler well i never genevieve exclaimed so that's why he can't go to the north arbor it's in massachusetts of course it is also he never goes into the northern end of the dining room or the living room or hall or hall in fact he merely is careful to keep on his own side of a definitely drawn line and therefore complies with the restrictions his den and his own bedroom and bath are all on the south side while mrs wheeler has a sitting-room boudoir and so forth on the north side she and maida can go all over the house but mr wheeler is restricted 
however they've lived that way so long it has become second nature to them and nobody bothers much about it do people know asked keefe the neighbors i mean oh yes but as i say it makes little confusion the trouble comes as miss lane suggested when wheeler wants to go to boston or anywhere else in massachusetts yet that is a small thing compared with his freedom observed keefe i think he got off easy but with wheeler it isn't so much the deprivation as the stigma he longs for a full pardon and would do most anything to have it but he refuses to stand for sam's election even with that for a bribe you can't pardon him now that you aren't governor can you mr appleby asked genevieve i can arrange to have it done in fact the present governor is ready and even anxious to pardon him but i hold the key to that situation myself you two needn't know all the details but now you know the principal points and i expect you to utilize them i'm willing enough and genevieve rocked back and forth thoughtfully and i may think of a way but for the moment i don't get chummy with maida suggested appleby let me do that keefe interrupted without undue conceit i believe i can influence the young lady and i think miss lane now that she knows the truth can jolly up mr wheeler to good effect but good gracious what do you want to do and genevieve giggled say i entice the old gentleman over the line then his pardon is cancelled and he's a criminal then you agree to ignore the lapse if he meets your wishes is that the idea appleby smiled a little crude miss lane and besides you couldn't get him over the line he's too accustomed to his limitations to be caught napping and not even your charms could decoy him over intentionally think so probably you're right well suppose i try to work through maida if i could persuade mr wheeler that she suffers from the stigma of her father's incomplete pardon yes that's it this thing can't be accomplished by brutal threats it must be done by subtle suggestion and convincing hints that's my idea agreed keefe if i could talk straight goods to miss wheeler and make her see how much better it would be for her father in his latter years to be freed from all touch of the past disgrace she might coax him to listen to you that's right now you know what you're here for just do what you can but don't make a mess of things i'd rather you did nothing than to do some fool thing trust us genevieve encouraged him as she rose me and kurt may not put over a big deal but we won't do anything silly the two men smiled as the girl with a pleasant good night went away to her own room she's true blue said keefe yes she is appleby nodded all her frivolity is on the surface like her powder and paint at heart that child has only my interests i quite appreciate it i hope you think the same of me mr appleby i do keefe more i trust you with my most confidential matters i'll own i want this business here to come out in my favor i can't push wheeler too hard so i ask your help but as i hinted i've one rod yet in pickle if necessary i'll use it but i'd rather not of course i hope you won't have to but i'll admit i don't see much chance of succeeding with the present outlook tomorrow morning we'll tell if we can't work the thing through by noon say i'll spring my last trap good night keefe good night mr appleby without apparent coercion the morning hours brought about a cosy session on the south veranda with miss lane and daniel wheeler in attendance while at the same time keefe and maida wandered over the beautiful park of the estate keefe had gently guided the conversation into confidential channels and when he ventured to sympathize with the girl in regard to her father's deprivation he was surprised at her ready acceptance of it oh you know don't you mr keefe 
she exclaimed but you don't know all it means to me you see she blushed but went steadily on you see i'm engaged to to a man i adore and don't tell me if you'd rather not he murmured no it's a relief to tell and somehow you seem so wise and strong go on then please the kind voice helped her and maida resumed well jeff a mr allen lives in boston and so so it would be very awkward if your father couldn't go there not only that but i've made a vow never to step foot into massachusetts until my father can do so too nothing would induce me to break that vow not even your lover said keefe astonished no my father is more to me than any lover then you don't truly love mr allen oh yes i do i do but father is my idol i don't believe any girl ever adored her father as i do all my life i've had only the one object to make him forget as far as possible his trouble now if i were to marry and leave him why i simply couldn't do it can't mr allen live in connecticut no his business interests are all in boston and he can't be transplanted oh if father could only do what mr appleby wants him to then we could all be happy can't you persuade him i've tried my best mother has tried too but you see it's a matter of principle and when principle is involved we are all in the same boat mother and i would scorn any wrongdoing quite as much as father does and you'll give up your life happiness for a principle of course wouldn't you wouldn't every decent person i couldn't live at all if i were knowingly doing wrong but your keefe stopped abruptly i know what you're going to say maida spoke sadly you were going to say my father did wrong i don't believe he did don't you know i know in my own heart i know he is incapable of the crime he was charged with i'm sure he is shielding someone else or else someone did it of whom he has no knowledge but my father commit a crime never do you care to tell me the details i don't know why i shouldn't it was long ago you know and dad was accused of forgery it was proved on him or the jury thought it was and he was convicted and sentenced yes to a long prison term but governor appleby pardoned him with that mean old proviso that he never should step into massachusetts was your mother then the heir to the massachusetts property no but mr appleby knew she would be so when she did inherit and had to live in massachusetts to hold the estate mr appleby thought he had dad where he wanted him were they foes politically yes because dad did all he could to keep mr appleby from being governor but didn't succeed no but almost so then mr appleby did this pardon trick to get even with father and i think it turned out more serious than he anticipated for mother took up the feud and she got lawyers and all that and arranged to have the house built on the line between the states was the estate she inherited on both sides of the line oh no but it was near the southern border of massachusetts and she bought enough adjoining land to make the arrangement possible then the house isn't on the ground she inherited not quite but the lawyers decided it so that she really complies with the terms of the will so it's all right was your mother the only heir so far as we can find out i believe there was another branch of the family but we haven't been able to trace it so as the years go by we feel more and more confident there's no other heir of course should one turn up his claim would be recognized further talk quickly convinced keefe that there was no hope of persuading maida wheeler to influence or advise her father in any direction other than his idea of right 
no amount of urging or arguing would make wheeler see his duty other than he now saw it or make maida endeavor to change his views with a sigh over his failure keefe deftly turned the talk in other channels and then they strolled back to the house as was to be expected genevieve had made no progress with her part of the plan her talk with mr wheeler had availed nothing he was courteous and kind he was amused at her gay merry little ways he politely answered her questions both serious and flippant but absolutely nothing came of it all samuel appleby had a short but straightforward conversation with mrs wheeler now sarah he said remember i'm your old friend as well as your relative i don't call you a relative she returned calmly a family connection then i don't care what you call it and i'm going to speak right out for i know better than to try sophistries if you can get dan to play my game regarding my son's campaign i'll see that dan gets full pardon and at once then maida can marry young allen and you can all go to boston to live sam appleby i'd rather never see boston again never have dan see it than to have him agree to endorse principles that he does not believe and dan feels the same way about it but don't you consider your daughter will you condemn maida to a broken-hearted life maida must decide for herself i think geoffrey allen will yet persuade her to leave her father she is devoted to dan but she is deeply in love with jeff and it's only natural she should go with him any other girl would do so without a second thought maida is unusual but i doubt if she can hold out much longer against her lover's pleading i think she will maida has your own unbreakable will so be it then the child must choose for herself but it doesn't alter the stand dan and i have taken nothing can alter that nothing samuel appleby that remains to be seen have i your permission to talk to maida alone certainly why not if you can persuade her to marry jeff i'll be only too glad if you find her determined to stand by her father then the case remains as it is at present and so as maida returned from her walk with keefe she was asked to go for another stroll with samuel appleby she assented though with no show of pleasure at the prospect but as they started off she said i'm glad to have a talk with you mr appleby i want to appeal to your better nature good that's just what i want to appeal to yours suppose you word your appeal first mine is simple to understand it is only that having had your own way and having spoiled my father's life for fifteen years i ask you in the name of humanity and justice to arrange matters so that his latter years of life shall be free from the curse you put upon him i didn't put it upon him he brought it on himself he never committed that crime and you know it what do you mean by that appleby gave her a startled glance had maida seen this glance she might have been enlightened but her eyes were cast down and she went on i don't know it surely but i am positive in my own heart father never did it however that's past history all i ask now is his full pardon which i know you can bring about if you want to and i will willingly and gladly if your father will grant my request to put your son in as governor with the same political views that prevented my father from voting for you you know he can't do that and yet you expect me to favor him but don't you see the difference your pardon will mean everything to father and to you yes but that's a secondary consideration i'd ask this for father just the same if it meant disaster for me i believe you would and appleby gazed admiringly at the sweet forceful face and the earnest eyes 
of course i should as i say it means life's happiness to him and his consent means just as much to me no it doesn't that's just it even though father doesn't definitely help you in your son's election he will do nothing to hinder and that's much the same it's far from being the same his positive and definite help is a very different matter from his negative lack of interference it's the help i want and i do want it do you suppose i'd come here and urge it beg for it if i didn't think it absolutely necessary no i suppose not but i know he never will grant it so you may as well give up hope you know that do you maida appleby's voice was almost wistful i most certainly do and the girl nodded her head positively then listen to me i have one argument yet unused i'm going to use it now and with you maida looked up in alarm appleby's face was stern his tone betokened a final even desperate decision oh not with me she cried i i'm only a girl i don't know about these things let's go where father is no you are the one in your hands must rest your father's fate your father's future sit here beneath the old sycamore you know about the tree yes of course never mind that now i've only a few moments but that's time enough you know maida how your mother holds this estate yes she must live in massachusetts well we do the lawyer said that isn't the point this is it there is another error we've always thought it possible maida spoke coolly though a dull fear clutched her heart it's more than a possibility it's a fact i know it and i know the heir who is it never mind for the moment suffice it to say that he doesn't know it himself that no one knows it but me now you and i know no one else does do you understand his keen gaze at her made her understand i she faltered you do understand he asserted you sense my proposition before i make it and you have it right you're a smart girl maida yes i suggest that you and i keep our secret and that in return for my silence you persuade your father to meet my wishes then he shall be fully pardoned and all will be well you criminal you dishonest and dishonorable man she cried her eyes blazing her cheeks reddening with her righteous indignation there there my girl have a care you haven't thought it all out yet doubtless you're going to say that neither your father nor mother want to remain here if my statement is true of course i say that they won't want to stay a minute who is the heir tell me and have you thought what it will mean to them to leave this place have you realized that your father has no business interests nor can he find any at his age do you remember that your mother has no funds outside the estate she inherited do you want to plunge them into penury into pauperism in their declining years yes if honesty requires it but the sweet voice trembled at the thought honesty is a good thing a fine policy but you are a devoted daughter and i remind you that to tell this thing i have told you means disaster ruin for you and your parents young allen can't support them they are unaccustomed to deprivation and he lowered his voice this heir i speak of has no knowledge of the truth he misses nothing since he hopes for nothing maida looked at him helplessly i must think she said brokenly oh you are cruel to put this responsibility on me you know why i do it i am not disinterested end of chapter three
Chapter Four of the Mystery of the Sycamore by Carolyn Wells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Big Sycamore Tree. At the south door, the Appleby car stood waiting. Genevieve was saying goodbye to Maida with the affection of an old friend. We're coming back, you know, she reminded, in two or three days, and please say you'll be glad to see me. Of course maida assented but her lip trembled and her eyes showed signs of ready tears cheer up genevieve babbled on i'm your friend whatever comes with time so am i put in curtis keefe good-bye for a few days miss wheeler how maida did it she scarcely knew herself but she forced a smile and even when samuel appleby gave her a warning glance at parting she bravely responded to his farewell words and even gaily waved her hand as the car rolled down the drive once out of earshot appleby broke out i played my trump card no you needn't ask me what i was for i don't propose to tell you but it will take the trick i'm sure why it's got to it must be something pretty forcible then said keefe for it looked to me about as likely as snow in summertime that any of those rigid puritans would ever give in an inch to your persuasions or mine added genevieve never before have i failed so utterly to make any headway when i set out to be really persuasive you did your best miss lane and appleby looked at her with the air of one appraising the efficiency of a salesman i confess i didn't think wheeler would be quite such a hard shell after all these years he's just like concrete keefe observed they all are i didn't know there were such conscientious people left in this wicked old world they're not really in the world appleby declared they've merely vegetated in that house of theirs never going anywhere oh come now mr appleby and genevieve shook her head boston isn't the only burg on the planet they often go to new york and that's going some not really often i asked wheeler he hasn't been for five or six years and though maida goes occasionally to visit friends she soon runs back home to her father it doesn't matter keefe said they're by no means mossbacks or hayseeds they're right there with the goods when it comes to modern literature or up-to-date news oh yes they're a highbrow bunch appleby spoke impatiently but a recluse like that is no sort of a man the truth is i'm at the end of my patience i've got to put this thing over with less polliver and circumlocution i thought i'd give him a chance just put the thing up to him squarely once and as he doesn't see fit to meet me halfway he's got to be the loser that's all he seems to be the loser as it is this from keefe but nothing to what's coming to him why the idea of my sparing him at all is ridiculous if he doesn't come down he's got to be wiped out that's what it amounts to wiped out how figuratively and literally mentally morally and physically that's how i've stood all i can i've waited long enough too long and now i'm going to play the game my own way as i said i played a trump card i raised one pretty definite ruction just before we left now that may do the business and it may not if not then desperate measures are necessary and will be used good gracious mr appleby genevieve piped up from her fur collar which nearly muffled her little face you sound positively murderous murder who i'd kill dan wheeler in a minute if that would help sam but i don't want wheeler dead i want him alive i want his help his influence yet when he sits there looking like a stone wall and about as easy to overthrow i declare i could kill him but i don't intend to it's far more likely he'll kill me why exclaimed keefe why should he 
and but you're joking not at all wheeler isn't of the murderer type or i'd be taking my life in my hands to go into his house he hates me with all of the strength of a hard bigoted but strictly just nature he thinks i was unjust in the matter of his pardon he thinks i was contemptible and false to our old-time friendship and he would be honestly and truly glad if i were dead but thank heaven he's no murderer of course not cried genevieve how you do talk as if murder were an everyday performance why people in our class don't kill each other the placid assumption of equality of class with her employer was so consistently miss lane's usual attitude that it caused no mental comment from either of her hearers her services were so valuable that any such little idiosyncrasy was tolerated of course we don't often agreed appleby but i'd wager a good bit that if dan wheeler could bump me off without his conscience knowing it off i'd go i don't know about that said genevieve musingly but i do believe that girl would do it what cried keith maida yes she's a lamb for looks but she's got a lion's heart if anybody ever had one talk about a tigress protecting her cubs it would be a milk and water performance beside maida wheeler shielding her father or fighting for him yes or killing somebody for him rubbish laughed appleby maida might be willing enough in that lion heart of hers but little girls don't go around killing people i know it and i don't expect her to but i only say she's capable of it gerda says keith spoke in his superior way we are all capable of crime even the best of us i remember that phrase mused appleby is it gerda's well i don't say it's literally true for lots of people are too much of a jellyfish makeup to have such a capability but i do believe there are lots of strong forcible people who are absolutely capable of crime if the opportunity offers that's it and genevieve nodded her head wisely opportunity is what counts i've read detective stories and they prove it be careful mr appleby how you trust yourself alone with mr wheeler that will do he reprimanded i can take care of myself miss lane genevieve always do when she had gone too far and instead of sulking she tactfully changed the subject and entertained the others with her amusing chatter at which she was a success at that very moment maida wheeler alone in her room was sobbing wildly yet using every precaution that she shouldn't be heard thrown across her bed her face buried in the pillows she fairly shook with the intensity of her grief but as often happens after she had brought her crying spell to a finish an exhausted nature insists on a finish she rose and bathed her flushed face and sat down to think it out calmly yet the more she thought the less calm she grew for the first time in her life she was face to face with a great question which she could not refer to her parents always she had confided in them and matters that seemed great to her even though trifling in themselves were invariably settled and straightened out by her wise and loving father or mother but now samuel appleby had told her a secret a dreadful secret that she must not only weigh and decide about but must at least until she decided keep from her parents for maida thought if i tell them they'll at once insist on knowing who the rightful heir is they'll give over the place to him and what will become of us her conscience was as active as ever it was her sense of right and wrong was in no way warped or blunted but instinct told her that she must keep this matter entirely to herself until she had come to her own conclusion moreover she realized the conclusion must be her own 
the decision must be arrived at by herself and unaided finally accepting all this she resolved to put the whole thing out of her mind for the moment her parents were so intimately acquainted with her every mood or shade of demeanor they would see at once that something was troubling her mind unless she used the utmost care to prevent it care too not to overdo her precaution it would be quite as evident that she was concealing something if she were unusually gay or carefree of manner so the poor child went downstairs determined to forget utterly the news she had heard until such time as she could be again by herself and she succeeded though haunted by a vague sense of being deceitful she behaved so entirely as usual that neither of her parents suspected her of pretense moreover the subject of samuel appleby's visit was such a fruitful source of conversation that there was less chance of minor considerations never will i consent her father was reiterating as maida entered the room why sarah i'd rather have the conditional pardon rescinded rather pay full penalty of my conviction than stand for the things young sam's campaign must stand for a clenched fist came down on the table by way of emphasis now dad said maida gaily don't thump around like that you look as if you'd like to thump mr appleby and i should i wish i could bang into his head just how i feel about it oh he knows and mrs wheeler smiled he knows perfectly how you feel but truly mother don't you think dad could well not do anything wrong but just give in to mr appleby for for my sake maida dear that is our only stumbling block your father and i would not budge one step for ourselves but for you and for geoffrey oh my dear little girl that's what makes it so hard for us then father can't you for our sake maida broke down it wasn't for her sake she was pleading nor for the sake of her lover it was for the sake of her parents that they might remain in comfort and yet comfort at the expense of honesty oh the problem was too great she hadn't worked it out yet i can't think her father's grave voice broke in on her tumultuous thoughts i can't believe maida that you would want my freedom at the cost of my seared conscience no oh no father i don't you know i don't but what is this dreadful thing you'd have to countenance if you linked up on the appleby side are they pirates or rascals not from their own point of view and dan wheeler smiled they think we are you can't understand politics child but you must know that a man who is heart and soul in sympathy with principles of his party can't conscientiously cross over and work for the other side yes i know that and i know that tells the whole story but father think what there is at stake your freedom and ours i know that maida dear and you can never know how my very soul is torn as i try to persuade myself that for those reasons it would be right for me to consent yet he passed his hand wearily across his brow and then folding his arms on the table he let his head sink down upon them maida flew to his side father dearest she crooned over him as she caressed his bowed head don't think of it for a minute you know i'd give up anything i'd give up jeff if it means one speck of good for you i know it dear child but run away now maida leave me to myself understanding both maida and her mother quietly left the room i'm sorry girly dear that you have to be involved in these scenes mrs wheeler said fondly as the two went to the sitting-room don't talk that way mother i'm part of the family and i'm old enough to have a share and a voice in all these matters but just think what it would mean 
if father had his pardon look at this room and think he has never been in it never has seen the pictures the view from the window the general coziness of it all i know dear but that's an old story your father is accustomed to living only in his own rooms and not to be able to go to the other end of the dining room or living room if he chooses it's outrageous yes maida i quite agree but no more outrageous than it was last week or last year yes it is it grows more outrageous every minute mother what did that old will say that you must live in massachusetts yes you know that dear of course i do and if you lived elsewhere what then i forfeit the inheritance and what would become of it in default of any other heirs it would go to the state of massachusetts and there are no other heirs what ails you maida you know all this no there are no other heirs you're sure as sure as we can be your father had every possible search made there were advertisements kept in the papers for years and able lawyers did all they could to find heirs if there were any and finding none we were advised that there were none and we could rest in undisturbed possession suppose one should appear what then then little girl we'd give him the keys of the house and walk out where would you walk to i've no idea in fact i can't imagine where we could walk to but that thank heaven is not one of our troubles your father would indeed be desperately fixed if it were you know maida from a fine capable business man he became a wreck because of that unjust trial father never committed the forgery of course not dear who did we don't know it was cleverly done and the crime was purposely fastened on your father because he was about to be made the rival candidate of mr appleby for governor i know and mr appleby was at the bottom of it your father doesn't admit that he must have been hush maida these matters are not for you to judge you know your father has done all he honestly could to be fully pardoned or to discover the real criminal and as he hasn't succeeded you must rest content with the knowledge that there was no stone left unturned but mother suppose mr appleby has something more up his sleeve suppose he comes down on dad with some unexpected some unforeseen blow that maida be quiet don't make me sorry that we have let you into our confidence as far as we have these are matters above your head should such a thing as you hint occur your father can deal with it but i want to help and you can best do that by not trying to help your part is to divert your father to love him and cheer him and entertain him you know this and you know for you to undertake to advise or suggest is not only ridiculous but disastrous all right mother i'll be good i don't mean to be silly you are when you assume ability you don't possess mrs wheeler's loving smile robbed the words of any harsh effect run along now and see if dad won't go for a walk with you and don't refer to anything unpleasant maida went and found wheeler quite ready for a stroll which way he asked as they crossed the south veranda round the park and bring up under the tree and have tea there dictated maida her heart already lighter as she obeyed her mother's dictum to avoid unpleasant subjects but as they walked on and trivial talk seemed to paul they naturally reverted to the discussion of their recent guests mr appleby is an old curmudgeon maida declared mr keefe is nice and well behaved but the little lane girl is a scream i never saw any one so funny now she was quite a grand lady 
and then she was a common little piece but underneath it all she showed a lot of good sense and i'm sure in her work she has real ability appleby wouldn't keep her if she didn't have her father rejoined but why do you call him a curmudgeon he's very well mannered oh yes he is and to tell the truth i'm not sure just what a curmudgeon is but he's it anyway i gather you don't especially admire my old friend friend if he's a friend give me enemies fee fee maida what do you mean remember he gave me my pardon yes a high old pardon say dad tell me again exactly how he worded that letter about the tree i've told you a dozen times he didn't mean anything anyhow he only said that when the big sycamore tree went into massachusetts i could go what a crazy thing to say wasn't it it was because we had been talking about the play of macbeth you remember till burnham wood shall come to dunsinade oh yes and then it did come by a trick yes the men came carrying branches we'd been talking about it discussing some point and then it seemed clever i suppose to appleby and he wrote that about the sycamore meaning never meaning never but burnham wood did go only by a trick and that would not work in this case why are you thinking of carrying a branch of sycamore into massachusetts maida returned his smile as she answered i'd manage to carry the whole tree in if it would do any good but i suppose oh puritan father you're too conscientious to take advantage of a trick can't say till i know the details of the game but i doubt appleby's being unable to see through your trick and then where are you that wouldn't matter trick or no trick if the big sycamore went into massachusetts you could go but i don't see any good plan for getting it in and two sycamore ridge wouldn't be sycamore ridge without it don't you love the old tree dad of course as i love every stick and stone about the place it has been a real haven to me in my perturbed life suppose you had to leave it daddy i think i'd die dear unless that is we could go back home isn't this home it's the dearest spot on earth outside my native state there there dad don't let's talk about it we're here for keeps heaven send we are dearest i couldn't face the loss of this place what made you think of such a thing oh i'm thinking of all sorts of things today but father while we're talking of moving couldn't you oh couldn't you bring yourself somehow to do what mr appleby wants you to do i don't know much about it but father darling if you only could maida my little girl don't think i haven't tried don't think i don't realize what it means to you and jeff i know oh i do know how it would simplify matters if i should go over to the appleby side and push sam's campaign as i could do it i know that it would mean my full pardon my return to my old home my reunion with old scenes and associations and more than that it would mean the happiness of my only child my daughter and her chosen husband and yet maida as god is my judge i am honest in my assertion that i can't so betray my honor and spend my remaining years a living lie i can't do it maida i can't and the calm sorrowful countenance he turned to the girl was more positive and final than any further protestation could have been end of chapter four